You're listening to Walk It Out with Trisha Goyer, where we discover what it looks like to follow God and be swept away on the journey of a lifetime. Author of over 70 books, mom of 10, yes, 10, homeschooler and speaker, Trisha Goyer will explore what radical obedience to God's word looks like. It's time to hear from God lovers who've dared to say yes. Listen in to Heart to Heart Chats and learn how others overcame doubts and fears. Discover how God used ordinary people to impact others one step at a time. If you're ready to get radical, get going, and make a difference in this world, you're at the right place. Here's your host, prolific writer, world traveler, people lover, and mega nap taker, Trisha Goyer. Well, hey, friends, I am so glad to have you back at Walk It Out Podcast. I have a super fun guest today, Sophie Hudson. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Now, Sophie loves to laugh. She began her blog, Boo Mama, in 2005. I think I'm, I think I started maybe 2006. So we're old timers in the business. That's right. (laughs) That's like 130 internet years, honestly. Exactly. And I, I also know you do the Big Boo cast, which is so fun. And I mean, that's been a while too. How long have you and Melanie been doing the Big Boo cast? For 13 years, which <laughs> is crazy. Crazy. So really, it's like pioneer time. <laughs> oh, I mean, covered wagon, the whole thing, for sure. Yes. Oh, and we're going to be talking about Sophie's new book, Stand All the Way Up, Stories of Staying In When You Want to Burn It All Down. Sophie, I'm so glad you're here. Okay. I couldn't figure out what I want to talk to you about first, Southern food or Kenya. I think oh. I'm going to go with Southern food because okay. your Instagram is so fun. Thank um, you. Love it. You want to tell a little bit about what you do on Wednesdays? Okay, so back at the beginning of quarantine when everybody was at home, I found that I was kind of making a lot of the comfort food that my mama used to make. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the kind it's the kind of food you can't eat every night or then you'd have a slew of other issues. But you know, every once in a while it's it's fun to cook that way. And so um one night I was getting ready to, to make a recipe of mama's called Mexican cornbread and I was like, Oh my gosh, I think I'm gonna do this on Instagram. I don't know why. I just thought <laughs> You know, I was, I've been at home all day. It was, you know, a way to interact with people. And so after I did it, my friend Stephanie said, um, you should do that every week and call it Weta Wednesday. And so I just started doing it. Weta is, was my mama and um, she was a phenomenal cook and loved to entertain and loved to, loved to have people into our home. And that was just really her, her deep abiding love. And so um, so on Wednesday nights, I do a Weta Wednesday and I cook a recipe that mama used to make when we were growing up. Sometimes it's um, something that she made exactly. Sometimes it's my variation of that. This past week, I did a, a recipe that was kind of the way she did it and the way my aunt Choxy did it, mm-hmm. kind of a mashup. So um, it's been super fun. I love it so much. Okay. So I grew up in Northern California and my grandma's Hispanic. So my comfort food was pozole, which is like hominy and pork and enchiladas. So that's for sure. Then John and I lived in Montana for 15 years and now we're in Arkansas. And I'm telling you, moving down here was like culture shock. I remember the first time I went to church, I was in the bathroom. I was sitting in the stall and it's like, bless your heart. And oh, sweetie. And I'm like, (laughs) what planet? have I landed on I didn't I, I, I was like laughing to myself so hard because it was like I was stepped into this tv show or I don't know still magnolias or something I don't know and I couldn't believe it like everyone was so sweet and then right. um we went to I, I have a teen mom support group and on Thursday nights we had different people bring meals so this lady brought chicken spaghetti oh. never had chicken spaghetti in my life and I'm like, what is this magical food? This chicken spaghetti. That and is, then, yes, yeah. actually something I, I want to make in the next couple of weeks. Oh is my gosh, spaghetti. please it's, do, please it's do. magic. Uh-huh. Yeah. And okay, so excuse me the recipe. I'm like, Velveeta, cream cheese, cream of mushroom soup, uh-huh. Rotel. I had never bought, I'd never bought Rotel or Velveeta before I lived in Arkansas. Like I didn't even know that it existed. And I'm like, okay, this is a magic, at least every two weeks we have chicken spaghetti and it's the most delicious thing ever. It's so good. Now, when you moved to Arkansas, did you wonder for just a little bit as your palate was kind of adjusting? And maybe this happened when you lived in Montana too, but did you wonder like, where did the flavor go? Like where, where did the the flavors that I know go? Cause we lived in South Louisiana for a little bit. And when we moved to Birmingham about 20 years ago, we had gotten so accustomed to that like super seasoned oh, food yeah. in South Louisiana that we were, we, it took us a minute to kind of readjust and remember that you don't put, you know, 
red pepper and Tony Shasheries and everything. So. <laughs> I, I, I do, though. I, we get that. We put it in everything. I don't know. Yeah. I'm cooking my own food. I take people's recipes and add more spices here and do this. And yeah, it's yeah. so, so good. I mean, all the all the comfort food. So I want to try that Mexican cornbread. I was looking it's at that good. recipe. And I'm like, mm. That it's good. good. I make it pretty spicy too. I like spicy food a lot and which is not always necessarily the Southern palate, but I think right. that our time in South Louisiana sort of rev that up in me. And so I really like spicy food. And I think I do that because, you know, Hispanic, I think I'm always sure. throwing some more spices than everything. Absolutely. Yeah. If a little bit of jalapeno is good, a lot's better. That's oh my I goodness. Mm-hmm. I love it. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. So then we have to talk about Kenya next because I was actually in Kenya with Awana I was a blogger oh, yeah. with Awana and went to the Masai Mara, although we uh, took a car over, it was like four hours on these dirt roads. It okay. was like, you got to fly though. I, listen, we <laughs> went into the Rift, we were in the Rift Valley, we drove down there and we went into, um, we went into a village, a Maasai village in the Rift Valley and we were in a car on dirt roads. For almost two hours, and it okay. was the most car sick I have ever been in my life. Now, when we got where we were going, the most beautiful people, the most gracious mm-hmm. welcome, the most mm-hmm. incredible day. But if I, I mistakenly sat in the back row of the the mm-hmm. kind of van thing we were in, and that was a bad idea on my part. It was not wise. Um, but what beautiful, what a beautiful place, and what beautiful people. One of my probably top three places I have ever been in my life. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so we went on into the Masai Mara in the early, early, early morning, like when the sun mm. was coming up. I think they were there at five o'clock. It was like the Garden of Eden. I told my it husband. Is. It was like the antelope are bouncing around yes. and the birds are flying and the giraffes. And I'm like, this is Eden like I've never experienced before. I just got, it was just like a, this holy moment of this is how the earth was created to be. Yes. Um, just being there. Yeah, I was talking to um, my friend Jamie, who was on that trip with me a couple of days ago, and we were reminiscing about the the day that we spent in the in the Masai Mara National Reserve, and just that whole feeling of like, okay, is this what the new heaven and the new earth is like? Because yeah. it's it's so stunning, words can't capture it, and and the intricacy of creation mm-hmm. in that place, and and we had the most wonderful guides on our safari. And just the fact that like there are specific birds that 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 thrive on a specific bug that thrives on a specific kind of buffalo. Like, yeah. you know, I mean, just just the intricacy of of God's creation is amazing. And and that is such a fun place to see it in action. Oh, it was so beautiful. And the animals were so, like, the giraffes were, like, so colorful. Like, yes. you know, we go to the zoo here in Little Rock. And <laughs> those poor right. little sickly giraffes. Well, and we're like, so, con- we're conditioned to zoos, you know? And so, yeah. and then I even had this thing where I was like, this is like Jurassic Park. And I'm like, no, this is not Jurassic Park. <laughs> this is, this is God's creation. And these animals are where they're supposed to be, doing what they're supposed to do. And it was just, I wouldn't take anything for having seen it. I think that yeah. I learned more in 24 hours mm-hmm. um, in, in the National Reserve there than, than I did in however many years I took, you know, biology classes and science classes to teach me about that stuff. Because um, it's just, it, the lessons are right in front of you, you know, and I had some great teachers, but when you see those lessons right in front of you, they just stick. Oh, absolutely. And um, I think we stayed in the same place you did with the tent. Because <laughs> yes. when I started reading your book, I'm like, oh yeah, we stayed there. That we, and they, they gave us locks to lock because, well, I want you to tell your monkey story. Okay. But they, they gave us locks because they're like, yeah, you need to lock everything, not because of people. So go ahead. Right. Exactly. The story that so, you begin the book with. Okay. So we had, when we got there, when we got to the Masai Mara, to the National Reserve, we went immediately on a safari ride. And then we went back and kind of had an afternoon to rest. And then we went on an evening safari ride, which was so gorgeous to see the sunset in that mm-hmm. particular context. And then as soon as we got back to the lodge where we were staying and the lodge, it's like there were tents, but they were, they were permanent tents. So you had a canvas roof, you had a canvas back wall, but you had wooden floors, you know, in the living, in the, in the bathrooms and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so we sat down for supper at this outdoor dining room, just a really gorgeous setting. And the heavens opened up and it, it was a, a generational thunderstorm. I mean, it was just <laughs> rain falling in sheets outside. And 
And of course, there's nothing around you to muffle the noise. So the sound of the thunderstorm is pretty majestic. And a, a man who was um, one of the managers at the lodge came up to our table and said, um, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. And of course, he had the most gorgeous Kenyan accent. He said, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but which of you is in number 27? And I just, I was eating my soup. My soup was delicious. <laughs> I, I don't know. And my son, who at the time I think was, I guess he was 15. He kind of nudged me under a table. And he was like, mama, we're in 27. And I was like, oh, we're in 27. And then it kind of starts to dawn on me like, oh, well, this cannot be good news. <laughs> So he starts asking me, the man does, all these questions about if I have any medication, like mm. kind of strange questions. And I was like, I don't know what. And so finally he looks at me and he said, ma'am, it would seem that the monkeys have gotten into your tent. <laughs> and so sure enough, the apparently, well, so our friend Sean, he was uh, worked with Compassion and has traveled. We've traveled with him a few times, um, just like lays out across the table. He's so tickled. He just because he knows, you know, this is yeah. <laughs> this is going to be a deal. So I immediately start worrying about our passports because we're flying home the next day. And I'm like, so are the monkeys like in the back of the tent just ripping our passports to shred in the rain, <laughs> shreds in the rain? So anyway, we finally get down to the to the tent and some very nice people who worked at the lodge had, had cleaned, you know, everything up. Apparently I had lured the, the monkeys into our tent because I left a bag of pistachio nuts out, um, not really even thinking about it. And then when I said, how did the monkeys get into our tent? Um, the man said, oh, the monkeys are very clever. They're very clever. <laughs> And another man told me the next morning, he was like, ma'am, when we went into your tent, clothes were strewn everywhere. <laughs> so the monkeys really got in our business. Are you just picturing and the monkeys like twirling your underwear? Oh, like over for sure. Flinging yes, in. <laughs> for sure. And so when we, um, the next day when we were getting ready to go on our last safari ride, like a, a dawn safari ride, which is another whole gorgeous experience. <laughs> Um, I, I was walking to the car and I thought if there was ever a metaphor for the last few mm. years that it's that like the monkeys have been all up in my business. And um, I, I took a little bit of satisfaction in that the pistachio nuts that I had left out were Cajun flavored. <laughs> That felt they, like they, a, had, a, they had a hard night. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't know that that's the the flavor profile for the monkeys, <laughs> but um, yeah, it was a whole it was a whole deal. I mean, you know, I, I've never in my life I don't think it, I don't think I ever will have a situation where the monkeys literally get in my stuff. Yeah, when we were there, they said you have to put these locks on. Because mm -hmm. I wonder, yeah, it might have been after your they were in your stuff <laughs> because yeah. they had to lock everything, and they're like, "Some people we're worried about." Well, they had told us about the door, and they even like they brought you coffee in the mornings, and there was a little tiny like monkey proof door where they would slide the coffee into your room. But apparently, one of the zippers on the windows had gone unsecured, mm. and we didn't know we didn't know how to do that. Um, and so, but the monkeys certainly knew how to, to maximize the impact of that unsecured zipper. So I something would else. To, yeah, that, that's, and laying there, I remember that night we could hear like the animals, like, yes. oh, it's just amazing. It it's amazing. amazing. It's so weird that I had a similar, not a similar experience with monkeys, but I was in Ecuador maybe six or seven years ago and we went to the rainforest mm. and, um, and listen, it's the hottest I've ever been, but I will never forget laying in the bed and you know, all you have is the sound of a ceiling fan and then the jungle, like it was <laughs> the craziest thing. And, you know, I, we just don't get a chance a lot to sort of experience creation to experience nature on that level and um there's something really sweet about it even if the monkeys get in your stuff I think so and I think the whole thing that I always am just amazed like I grew up we were poor like we lived mm -hmm. in a tiny little house we had blankets on the for curtains I mean I, I showed my kids my childhood home and they're like you lived in that I mean it's just a tiny little thing and then God is able to use me and you like through our words talking to people through this amazing influence that he's given us that I feel so undeserving at times to be able to go and experience these types of things and I think you know I mean you have used your influence to bring so much laughter but I love oh, it this, this new book it's like okay we gotta we gotta talk about some real stuff too I mean there's I was laughing but there's Thanks. also like we need to talk about some truths and get real and the monkeys have been in our business and we need to talk about yeah them. and I think that's just how the Lord is I think so sweet to to work and maybe that too I think that's just how I learn 
is in the middle of the day to day, you know, like Mm -hmm. I can, I can hear some sort of hypothetical um, example and, and I'll internalize it and I'll think about it. But when I see something play out in the day to day, right in front of my eyes tends to stick. And, um, and I, I love that about God. I love that Mm -hmm. he teaches us obviously through scripture and through his word for sure. And, but I also love that he, he teaches us in just our day-to-day circumstances that his character and his creation are so consistent that you can find really trustworthy lessons there. And that's been a real, um, a real encouragement. And I think too, like just at this stage of life, when things can be kind of hectic and everybody's trying to manage, you know, their kids and yeah. trying to manage work and their families and a pandemic and all the yeah. things. Um, I, I think it's sometimes easier for me to see him in the day to day just because, you know, you can get, you can get so wrapped up in stuff that you may not um, be in scripture as much. We haven't been able to go to our physical churches as much, mm-hmm. but he is still right here in our midst, just teaching and comforting and, um, um, it's been really sweet in a way to be able to hear from him so clearly in those ways. Absolutely. And I think there's so much now that I realize that we just took for granted, yeah. like my kids going to summer day camp and yeah, I mean, all the, <laughs> all the fun things I'm like, Oh, they're going to be with me every day now. Cause I'm not yeah. dropping them off at That's day right. camp for six hours or whatever. Yeah. But I've had more friends who have said, I have a friend of mine said this last night that there's been so much sweetness in, Mm -hmm. I mean, it has been challenging. I do not mean to dismiss how challenging it has been, especially for people who have really small children right now, you know, just it's their, their challenges for sure. But I don't, I don't know that we'll ever see a time like this again. Um, And I had, listen, I, I, I I hate the reason for it. I would never wish the reason for it, but um, where we just have the gift of so much uninterrupted time together. And so I, I've tried to come at it that way, you know, instead of being frustrated by the way things are different. Um, mm-hmm. And there are real frustrations in that, but I think there are also real some really bright glimmers of hope and goodness in the middle of it too. Oh, absolutely. And I think, I mean, talking about the monkeys in their business, they're definitely now, it's like all the stuff that we I know. Listen, I didn't even know. Yeah, yeah. You didn't even know when you were writing the book. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't even know. But, um, but still, I'm really, I'm really grateful. The last five months have been hard in, in specific ways, but they've also been really good in specific ways. And I hope that, you know, we come out on the other side, having learned some good lessons, um, you know, about specifically about the illness that we've been dealing with, but also, um, just about the gift of every single day, you know, and and what it means to really dig in and, and do life together. Absolutely. So before, you know, the last five months and you, you know, when you were writing this book, what were some of the things that you really wanted to get across from your heart to let people know, okay, we need to talk about these issues? Oh gosh. You know, I, it really has, has been a challenging four or five years for, and again, not, again, nothing that I would consider unusual. Right. But I think again, that this stage of life just brings some specific challenges. One of those was that um, my mother was diagnosed with dementia mm-hmm. and then my mother passed away four years ago. Um, and so you kind of go through, I think everybody experiences it at some point where you're trying to figure out what it looks like to care for your aging parents. Um, and my daddy's still alive. He's super healthy in his eighties. And so, um, but you know, you still have that kind of like low level concern all the time. Yeah. Um, about, about what that looks like. I have struggled a lot with the sort of the tone of our, our national discourse Mm -hmm. over the last four or five years has been really hard for me. I have struggled in places, you know, we've just seen so much, um, exposure, which is good of, um, some things in the church that needed to be exposed, um, in terms of, um, injustices, things in our culture, um, where there were injustices that have needed to be addressed. But but when you look at all those, and a lot of that stuff has kind of come to a head over the last, you know, three or four months. But when you when you look at it um, all at one time, you just can feel overwhelmed by it. And so one of the things that I have really processed a lot and we're a place where I've tried to listen a lot over the last um, three or four years, especially is in, in regards to systemic racism mm-hmm. and um, and and where honestly, where I have been complicit in that, where I have been tone deaf to that, 
where I have been inactive in that, that fight. Um, and so I just really kind of wanted to dig in there. And then what I've realized too, is that I've had over the course of these last three or four years, I've had a lot of anger build up and I'm a nine on the Enneagram. Anger is not a comfortable place for me. Yeah. Um, I don't even know it sometimes when I feel it. Um, and then when it, when it comes out, I always say it feels a lot like grief, like just a lot of sadness. And so, um, figuring out what it means to deal with my own anger, particularly where that anger is connected to um, my country that I love mm-hmm. and where that ang- anger is connected to the church that I love. Yeah. Um, that has really been a challenge. And so I kind of wanted to dig in, 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 in some of those areas and in regard to my physical health, which I had really gotten to a bad place in terms of just neglecting it um, and really realized that after mama passed away, how I was not in a great place. So um, just trying to figure out in my life where I had been quiet and maybe where I erred on the side of people pleasing, as opposed to where would Jesus stand in those situations? Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that's kind of what I wanted to, I wanted to look into that. I wanted to dig into that. I wanted to write about that. And um, it was, it was super therapeutic um, to do that. And I, I think so many times when we're, I'm, I just turned 49 last week. So, yeah. you know, I'm I, in our 20s and 30s. It's just like we're trying to make our house cute and <laughs> to make our kids yeah. cute. And, and that's good. That's a, yeah, those are good things. You know, I think that absolutely you, you kind of you direct your energy sort of um, at your own family or mm-hmm. your own, right, you know, right inside your own close few friends. And I think there's something about the back half of the forties, or at least for me, the back half of the forties where you start to go, okay, with the time I have left, what do I want to be about? And, and what really deeply matters to me? How do, how do I want to interact in those places that really deeply matter to me? And I think that's good. I think that's a sweet thing for the Lord to do. It kind of renews your purpose as you head into the sort of the back half of your life. Yeah. And I think we look at things differently and we pay attention mm-hmm. more. At least I do. Um, I've, I've led a teen mom support group since 2001. I was a teen mom. I had my oldest son when I was 17. And, you know, in Montana, I mean, most of the girls, even though they were young teen moms, they were like me. And right. when we came to Little Rock, a lot of inner city young moms and just the uh, just sitting in the room, I just felt like I I didn't even understand so much. I mean, one of there was a shooting and one of the girls had lost a cousin and everyone was talking about these different people I lost. And I, you know, paused in the middle of their conversation. I'm like, how many of you lost someone to violence? Um, mm. You know, just on the streets, every single one of the 12 girls in the room raised their hand wow. and like a, a cousin, a brother, an uncle. Right. And I'm like, what world am I landed in our world? Like I was just so, not tuned in and not paying attention. And I think once we start hearing stories, then we want to hear more stories. We want to understand Absolutely. more. Absolutely. Yeah. And we want to share more. You know, we've adopted um, seven kids, six of them from foster care. Every single day I'm hearing something about their experiences. We adopted them as teenagers of what they went through and different things. And I'm like, I was just living my happy life, like right. going to Costco and didn't even right. realize that yeah. these kids that are now I call, my kids were, were living these things, but it does. It, I think it, our, I don't know, our eyes are open more, our ears are open more, and we're ready to pay attention kind of beyond ourselves is what I found personally. Yeah. And I've had so many different people say to me over the course of the last couple of years, like, I just don't know what to do. I don't know what to do mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, trying to step into some some sort of involvement maybe in whether that's in their communities or in their churches. And, um, and I almost always say, I think before we step in, because our tendency, um, I think, especially as moms, a, a lot of times is we're going to go in and fix. Yeah. And I think to, exactly what you're talking about to sit down and to listen and to mm-hmm. really internalize, like to, to not just assume, Oh, I can listen, I can get this handled, but to really become people who listen and um, empathize and who want to understand before we feel like we can fix. Because I think once we understand, what we realize is, oh, I can't fix, but I can love. You know, I can I can love, I can encourage, I can um, I can even disciple. But um, but it takes the quick fix out of you, I think, yeah. when you really start to listen. I think so much. And we want to like give here, I'll give money here and that will make us feel better. But really, that's not what people want. They want us they want us to hear. They want us to listen. They want us to care. 
and just call and say, how are you doing today? You know, I, yeah. there's a lot of stuff going on and how are you doing today? And I yeah, I feel like empathy, empathy is a dying art. I feel like, yeah. um, you know, we just, we're just not conditioned to sit in stuff with people because we live in a world where we literally can just scroll through whatever heartache we run across. And um, I was watching last week, I got all into this show on Netflix called Linux Hill, which is a documentary about four doctors in New York City who work for a hospital called Linux Hill. And what moved me so much, I mean, they're brilliant, skilled physicians and surgeons, but what moved me so much about that show, and it's just six or seven episodes, is that um, they were so deeply empathetic with their patients. You know, they were so, they really care so much and it made me cry to see that in action, you know, where they, they, uh, and it was, there, there were real people on those mm-hmm. operating tables with mm-hmm. real stories. And I think, you know, if I can remind myself to, to just have a mindset that every interaction I have is with a real person who has a real story. Um, I think that builds empathy and compassion in us um, so that we can, we can be people who, um, go into hard situations, different situations with um, people who are struggling in whatever way and, um, and, and stand like Jesus would. Yeah, absolutely. It reminds me of um, years ago, my kid, my kids were probably like three, four and six or something like that. My mm-hmm. youngest kids. And we went to a doctor's appointment and uh, we came out and I was just getting the kids in their car seats and stuff. And I turned around, this man was there in a wheelchair and he looked, I, I don't know if he was homeless, but you could tell he was, um, you know, didn't have a lot. And he said, ma'am, do you happen to have anything to eat? Well, I have kids, you know, I have have goldfish crackers and all these things. (laughs) Got a lot Uh, of snacks. I had a lot of snacks. But I also, that day we had gone to Bible study and because we had a doctor's appointment, this, okay, this is the South, I'm telling you. We went to Bible study and I told my leader that we wouldn't be able to stay. And she packed me a lunch because they were having a social. (laughs) I'm like, I love this South. Mm-hmm. so much and so there's chicken salad sandwiches in this little bag in my car and I said oh, I have some chicken salad sandwiches and I was so happy that yeah. I gave it to him and we were you know like uh, and then I had also picked up some donuts for my grandma who loves Mexican pastries and I had there's a little store by the doctor's office I'd got some to take them home to her and I gave him some of those and I was just like so happy and I was like how are you doing today and here's you know and he was thank so thankful I get in the car and the kids are like who is he and what's going on? And, and I did, yeah. they'd been watching the whole time and I hadn't realized, but it was like, you know what? He's, he's a real man. I don't know what his story is, but how, like, look what God was able to do to like yeah. help us serve him and just start the conversation. I think so many times we don't know what to say, or like you said, we don't listen to people and these are real people and we don't know mm-hmm. their whole story. But in that moment, it was just so good of God to like have chicken salad sandwich. <laughs> I can like share with him and then share the story with the kids and get us to be aware of these things. Um, I'm yeah, like just a documentary too, but that looks sounds so good. It's so good. Yeah. Just to see, I think to see people as people mm-hmm. um, and not as inconveniences, you know, I don't know. It's um, obviously the last five months have been a time for me yeah. for some deep introspection about this kind of stuff, but um, it does just make you realize you know, we run into so many people over the course of our days um, under when we're in more of a normal, you know, situation. I don't know. I just think um, my friend Angela said to me back in September, just kind of offhandedly, she said, I just want to be a person who carries the presence of Jesus with me no matter where mm. I go. And I was like, oh, I mean, that just hit me so hit, hit me way down deep in my heart. And I think that, you know, being mostly at home for the last five months has made me um, crave really the opportunity to be a person who carries the presence of Jesus with me wherever I go. I can't, I can't wait to go, you know, I can't, yeah. but in the meantime, um, I want to carry the presence of Jesus with me, obviously in the walls of my house and the few people we get to see right now. Mm-hmm. And um, I, that feels like a good goal to me, you know, that yeah. feels like a good, a good place to land. Well, I know even like, 
watching your Instagram stories, making potato salad. I'm like, th- you had no idea that today I was like watching you make potato salad on Instagram. Right. But I was like, it just brightened my day. I had a huge smile on my face. You know what I mean? It's just those little things that we're just loving and serving and having fun and yeah. bringing smiles. And I think that goes a long way. We'd never know how we're going to lift up someone's day. So that, that was fun. And speaking of lifting up, I love the story you talk about about Moses um, and about just, you know, having people there to support him with Aaron yeah. and her. So I'll just share a little bit about that because so, I just love yeah. how you shared that. Oh, well, thank you. I was actually, I was getting ready a few years ago. I was going to, I work at a school in Birmingham and I was getting ready to speak to our junior high girls. And uh, that morning I had read the story of Moses and Aaron and her and how when they were getting ready when, when the Israelites were getting ready to fight the Amalekites, Joshua was on the ground and Moses was kind of going up on the hill to direct the traffic. And so when Moses would raise his staff, the Israelites would do really well. When he would lower the staff, things didn't go so great. So Aaron and her would lift Moses's arms so that they wouldn't get tired. And it made me think about the fact that there are battles all around us. Um, mm. and there are, Um, Just a lot of places where I think our response just sort of naturally is to kind of avert our eyes and and maybe not just, you know, not engage with what's going on. Um, But I think we have a lot of opportunities in the here and the now to to, even if we're not going to be the ones who are on the battlefield like Joshua or directing the traffic like Moses, we can lift one another's arms and we can be a support for one another. And and what has really occurred to me over the last couple of months is that when Aaron and her, her um, when they went to the top of the hill with Moses and when they lifted up his, his arms, their support was visible and their support was clear. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think that um, I, I want to make sure, you know, in different situations, and that's going to look different for everybody because the things that we're passionate about, the, the, the places where we feel compelled or called to, to engage in whatever the battle is um, in a way that Jesus would, um, we want our support to be visible and we want our support to be clear. And so um, that's really, it's been an encouragement to me that story has for the last few years. Um, but I, I just, I think if there were ever a time for us to be about the business, to lift one another's arms, this is it. This is it. Absolutely. And, you know, I think this is, I mean, the perfect time for that visible and clear. Mm -hmm. And if God has a friendship that you can help lift someone up, we living in Little Rock um, have gone to a multi-ethnic church for many years and just hearing the stories of what people experience. I mean, not, I'm not talking about 50 years ago either. I'm talking about a doctor. Yes. Getting a a black doctor, the way he's talked to in the operating room as he's operating. I mean, just, and just listening and, and letting people know, that I am going to sh- talk to you, share your story with others, let people know this is a real thing and you know, Absolutely. Just, just cheer you on. I think so many times, and I love how you said like when you feel you need to do so- say something, because I think there's so many things we can be passionate about. I mean, it can be o- overwhelming if for us to give a voice <laughs> right. to everything, but if there's right. you have a friend that shares a story that you need to support them or like with me with an inner city te- teen mom, do something, say something. You don't have to be passionate about everything, but if you have right. an opportunity today, do something. And I love that visible and clear. Like visible I love and that clear. so much. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, and again, and that Aaron and her weren't trying to fix anything either. You know, mm-hmm. they were just, they were supporting the people who were called to, to, to Moses at the top of the hill and Joshua at the, at the, at the foot of the hill. Um, they were, they were support people. And, and so I, you know, we don't have to necessarily, you know, all start like a 501c3 corporation, you know, to address something, but we can, we can get in it with people who are already doing good work. And there are so many people who are all really doing good work. It's why I've loved the whole pass the mic thing on Instagram. It's because you see how many women are, are, are doing phenomenal work, um, in their communities and for the body of Christ. And, and, um, and you get to hear those stories. And I think that's, that's a great example of support that's visible and clear, you know, is to, to elevate voices that people may not have heard. Yeah. And I love it. And I, one thing that you say is you talk about not being ruled by anger. Yeah. Um, but then you say, I don't want to be ruled by anger. I want to fight for something for someone for the cause of the kingdom in the here and now. Yeah. And I think there's such a big difference of letting anger control us 
and then also fighting for truth and fighting for what's right. I think um, there's so many good things in this book, That's which, nice. which I also love. Like there's wonderful humor too. <laughs> so, well, thanks. That's you know, sweet. So yeah, I, so, um, I appreciate that. Thank you. I do want to, I do want to fight for, um, for something, you know, and I think that, um, we can all rail against what we, you know, what gets on our nerves or the places that frustrate us or whatever. And there are times certainly where we need to vent, we need to process that. And, but we don't need to necessarily do all of that publicly. I'm not Mm -hmm. sure that that's super helpful. Right. Um, but to call people forward, I think, um, and, and to, to walk with people as they move forward, I think being proactive instead of reactive in my anger. Um, and it's not always easy because I mean, we, we live in a world where there's a lot coming at you, you know, and, and listen, we have opportunities to get angry, like on the hour, um, just because there's, there's so much happening and, and everybody's voices are so loud so to really plug into the places to, to think through, like, what am I about? What am I for? Where do I want to fight um, for what is right and true and good? Um, I think that's a, I think that's a healthy way to move through it. Yeah, absolutely. And what I love is that God put all this on your heart two years ago, knowing what people would need to hear now. The, it's the craziest thing. I, I'll never forget writing the next, I was writing the next to the last chapter of the book where I wrote about Moses and Aaron and her. Yep. I had gone to a, um, a state park in Georgia that's um, in Pine Mountain, FDR State Park. They ha- it's just a gorgeous place. It's quiet. And it was a good place for me to kind of get away and write. And I like the Lord was so clear um, in ways that I don't even know if I can articulate as I was writing all that stuff. And it seemed like a, it, it felt honestly like I was making a hard left Um in terms of where I had been even in the chapter before, but it mm-hmm. was, it was just where he had me. And so, you know, I don't, I don't ever, I can't pretend to understand how yeah. he, how he does what he does, but, um, but golly, it was a, it was a sweet time and um, just kind of putting pen to paper with some of that stuff. And it's been really kind of weird how it lines up with where we are. Well, yeah. Cause he knows, he knows what's coming. He, he does. Knows <laughs> He does know. And I think so many times when I write something, when I read it back later or, and talk about it on interview or anything, I'm like, oh, this is for me too. This is yeah, so oh, for sure. for yeah. me. <laughs> oh, a hundred percent. No doubt about it. And so, wow. um, I don't know, you know, every, every book has its own little, there, there's just like a, you know, two or three things I think that I take away from every book that the, yeah. the Lord really kind of was teaching me as I was I was writing. And so, um, this one has been special for, for that reason. Just, just a reminder, it may feel random. Listen, you know, (laughs) like you may not understand why this is where your heart is, is, um, kind of tugging a bit in the moment, but he's up to something. So. Oh, I love that so much. Well, again, the book is stand all the way up stories of staying in when you went to burn it all down. Sophie, I just appreciate you being here today. Where can people go just to find out more information about you and the book? Well, thank you for having me. First of all, I've loved talking to you. And um, the second thing is I miss the day of internet school where they taught you that all your social media handles needed to be the same thing. (laughs) (laughs) I was, I I guess I was sick that day. I don't know. So on Instagram, I'm boomama205. On Twitter, I'm just boomama. And um, and then on Facebook, it's really long. It's Sophie Hudson boomama. Just, you know, maybe Google. Maybe just just Google. Well, I will put it in the show notes too. You know, I know some people don't always go check that. So it's easy just to have them search boomama and they're going (laughs) to find it. It'll pop up. Just It'll be careful up. how you spell that. That's what I would say. Just be real careful how you spell that when you Google because oh. you can, you, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you, well, sh- you, you don't necessarily want an extra B in there is all I'm oh. going to say. Oh, <laughs> so, See, you always make me laugh. I <laughs> love it. Anyway. Sophie, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Trisha. I appreciate it. I just love Sophie Hudson. She is such joy. Whenever... I just want a boost and something uplifting. I love searching her out, especially on Instagram. You are going to love her little Insta stories. I know I do. But what I also love is that Sophie's about the real stuff too and about the hard stuff. It's not just all fun and games. It's 
paying attention to what really matters in the lives of those around us. And we can be a voice. Now, I used to be one who hated confrontation. Arguing was uncomfortable to me, and I worried that stating my mind would make people mad. But then I became a mom of kids who needed me to fight for them. I had to go against labels, and I had to find solutions. I had to not let people give me a no when my kids needed a yes. And I've learned through the years, just like Sophie has, that it's good to be strong and to stand up for those without a voice. I started looking around and paying attention to my community. Sophie did too. And it's important to call out injustice, even if it makes us feel uncomfortable. Because what really may be my uncomfortable might be completely life-changing for someone else. And so I'm so thankful for Sophie. Make sure you check up her check out her book, Stand All the Way Up, and uh, just connect with her and let her know that you are going to do that in your community. You're going to be a voice. So the walk it out verse of the week is Psalm 3, 3, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the one who lifts my head. And I loved how so Sophie said, you know, we need to ask God to lift our heads and look around and to pay attention to what is happening right in front of us with our brothers and sisters and not get caught up in false peace when there's so much going on that we can be a voice of, a voice for. And so really when we talk about, yes, we want God to lift our heads, show, have him show us where to give our attention to, who to be an advocate for. We also know, like Psalm 3, 3 says, that God is a shield about us. We do not have to do this alone. So let me just pray for us today. So Lord, I just thank you so much for Sophie. I thank you for her family and all that you're doing to use her to encourage, to inspire, to bring laughter and joy and hope to her community. I pray that you'll continue to bless her ministry, Lord. And I thank you for her encouragement for all of us to just lift our heads, to stand all the way up to make a difference, to be a voice to other people. I know sometimes it is easier just to look away and to stay in our comfort zone, Lord, but help us to step out of our comfort zone so that other people might be blessed and encouraged and supported. And I know when we turn to you, we ask like, who can we love today? Who can we support today? That you'll always bring someone to mind. So I pray that you'll just help us to stand up and to be bold knowing that you are a shield around us. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to Walk It Out. I'm always encouraged that you take the time to just sit down or walk or wherever I drive. I don't know where you're listening to this podcast, but that you are willing to connect with me and these amazing people that I chat with. So be sure to share the podcast with a friend. Send them to walkitoutpodcast.com. Tell them they can subscribe on iTunes or any podcast app. And if you have someone that you think would make an amazing guest, be sure to email me at hello at trishagoyer.com. I would love to hear it. I always love meeting new friends. And finally, if you are in a place right now where you need some encouragement about maybe your kids' schooling choices, I also want to remind you that my course, Homeschool Success Course, is available for you. I took all my best tips after homeschooling for over 25 years. I put them in 13 modules. I had three bonus videos of topics that I speak at at conferences. There's a workbook. There is a homeschool planner, and you can all find it all at homeschoolsuccess.com. You could also talk to a friend. Um, you could, I won't even care if you get the videos together and watch them together. That would be awesome. Also, if you know someone that's homeschooling, gift it to that person. It can bring so much encouragement to these overwhelmed parents who never thought that this is what their life would look like. So stand up and be a good supporter of your homeschooling friend today. But thank you so much for tuning in to Walk It Out. I pray that you will be blessed. Thanks for listening to Walk It Out. Head over to the show notes for this podcast and all past episodes at www.walkitoutpodcast.com. If you love the show, share it with someone you know who can make a radical difference in the world. We love new friends. See you next time.